Over the last two weeks, we have learned that the term Christian is a biblical word, but the Christians were not members of Christianity. Instead, according to the scriptures, they were members of the way. We have discovered that there is a vast difference between the concept of being a disciple of Jesus who follows his word obediently in the way, compared to the anti-biblical perspective that a Christian is simply someone who said a prayer at some point in their lives and continued living in willful disobedience to the word of God. We saw how the book of Hebrews was written to encourage a real and specific group of Christians to hold on to the Messiah and the new covenant in his precious blood all the way to the end to receive the promised eternal rest. And we have witnessed that verse after verse in this epistle to the Hebrew disciples points to the foundational principle of faithful endurance on the path of obedience until the end. So with these facts in mind, let's look at a few of those verses now. In chapter 3, the author explains that we can prove that we belong to the household of the Messiah if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And the key phrase in this conditional statement that begins with if is to the end, meaning we must hold fast to the end. A few verses later they add, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So they repeat the key phrase in this conditional passage also. And then, in chapter 6 they wrote, We desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end that you do not become sluggish but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So all through the letter, the picture of continuing on the path of faith and hope until the end is emphasized. Plus in chapter 10 they state, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Or in other words, we will not receive the promise of a better and enduring possession in heaven until after we have done the will of God by persevering to the end. So when they summarize their main exhortation in chapter 12, it makes sense that they wrote, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The entire letter to these disciples of Jesus Christ was designed to encourage them to endure in the way until the end. And if we think about following Jesus and his example, even for a moment, we realize that a key part of the pattern he laid out for us was enduring all the way to the finish line. He never faltered in his complete submission to the Father's will. And that's why the complete thought here in Hebrews is, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our Savior was eternally rewarded for his determined perseverance through the most difficult experiences of suffering unjustly, and we will be rewarded also if we follow his perfect example in the power of the Holy Spirit. But here in chapter 12, we see the rich metaphor of life in the way as we follow Jesus being compared to running a race. And this is not the only time in Scripture that analogy is employed. In Acts, while discussing the impending dangers to his life if he returned to Jerusalem, Paul explained, None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. 
so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul notably pictured his own life in the Messiah as a race to the finish line. And about John the Baptist, using the exact same Greek word that describes a race, once again, the Apostle Paul explained, as John was finishing his course or race, he said, who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. So Paul taught that John's life was analogous to a race as well. And only when Paul's earthly life was close to ending did he actually write, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So Paul was focused on running and finishing his race well, just as John had finished his race without falling away from the truth of God's word. And because Paul was so concerned with his complete compliance with the scriptures and the revealed will of God, he explained to the Galatians, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. Even after personal encounters with Jesus, Paul wanted to check in with the apostles of the Messiah to make sure his gospel was in compliance with what they knew their Savior had taught. And only after they confirmed that both his ministry and his message were consistent with the message of Jesus was Paul confident that he was running his race properly. And this is why Paul instructs us all by saying, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Not long after he wrote, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So the race metaphor was a favorite of Paul's, and it is very unique to him. But with it, he frequently encouraged the disciples to exercise disciplined endurance in their own race while consistently checking their current course against the scriptures to make sure that they didn't stray from the way of truth. Therefore, because some of the recipients of the epistle to the Hebrews were shrinking back from the way due to persecution, sin, and false doctrine, they were encouraged to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This very Pauline-like admonition perfectly summarizes one main reason the letter we call Hebrews was written. And as we learned last week, another key purpose of the letter was to identify the true way or course that they were to continue running in. Obviously, just as it was critically important that they run with endurance until the end to receive the promises, it was equally as important that they run the specific course or way that was set before them, not in some other race. And this brings us to some of the most striking theological comparisons ever presented in Scripture. Comparisons between the prophets and Jesus comparisons between the angels and Jesus, comparisons between Moses and Jesus, 
Comparisons between the promises of the first covenant and the promises of the new covenant in Jesus. Comparisons between the Levitical high priests and the priesthood of Jesus. And comparisons between the Levitical tabernacle cleansed by animal blood and the heavenly tabernacle cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And each comparison mentioned is presented as a direct and explicit evaluation of the first covenant in the light of the new covenant with one key word describing the conclusion of the authors and ultimately that key word was better. In chapter 1, Jesus is labeled as better than the angels. In chapter 7, we are told that Jesus mediates a better covenant. In chapter 8, we are told that the new covenant was established on better promises. In chapter 9, the better tabernacle is cleansed with better sacrifices. And in the end of chapter 11, after listing those who had gone before us in the faith, we are told God provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. You see, the entire letter was written to reveal the relationship between the Levitical covenant given to Moses and the new covenant established by the blood of our victorious Messiah. Therefore, the writers openly proclaim, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Their self-proclaimed main point was a comparison between Jesus, our high priest, who is seated at the right hand of the Father in the holiest of all, because he has finished with his sacrifices forever, compared to the perpetually standing Levitical high priest who had to offer their sacrifices over and over again, all while the veil of the Holy of Holies stayed metaphorically closed. Their self-proclaimed main point was a comparison between the earthly sanctuary or tabernacle made with human hands after the pattern Moses was shown on the mountain compared to the glorious heavenly sanctuary where the Father and the Son are actually seated in their majesty while being worshipped by real heavenly angels, not carvings and woven images. And their self-proclaimed main point was that the Levitical priesthood and its ceremonial system of purification served as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So above all else, Jesus is the exalted mediator of a superior covenant established on better promises and we must not turn away from him and the salvation he offers. The fact is that one of the most important interpretational challenges in all of scripture is understanding which items were established as shadows that direct us to the Messiah and the new covenant in his blood and which items were established as timeless commandments of our Creator that never change. We must let Scripture and Scripture alone be our guide as we do this, and that means that we must never go beyond what is written. But that also means that when something is plainly written, we must not fight against God's Word and twist the plain meaning. We must accept 
all that is written and understand that certain elements of the Levitical system of purification were imposed until the time of Reformation spoken of in Hebrews about these types of issues impacted by this very important interpretational principle. Paul explains, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And this is consistent with dozens of verses in the post-Messianic scriptures, including when Hebrews unambiguously explains that the Levitical system was concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Truly, the Levitical system of the First Covenant gave us the pattern to understand the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. And in this way, the Levitical laws of purification became our tutor to lead us to Jesus, our Savior, that we could be justified by faith in him. We could never understand the Messiah's amazing role as our high priest and perfect sacrifice if we did not first have the Levitical covenant and the pattern given to Moses to foreshadow all that the Messiah would do. And for this reason, it is very important that we still understand it. And likewise, we would not have been able to understand the big picture of our life in Jesus Christ and the race we are running in his strength if we first did not have the exodus to foreshadow this great journey to the promised land that we are part of. Delivered from the bondage of sin by the blood of the Passover lamb, after having put away the leaven of sin and wickedness from our lives, pressing on in the eternal hope of the gospel while walking after the righteous guidance of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, remembering the trumpet that will sound when our Lord descends from heaven and the awesome day of judgment when he returns to tabernacle with his people forever, the exodus and the holy feasts of the Lord serve to remind us that we are just passing through this life in the way to the true promised land. But unlike the rest that Joshua provided the children of Israel, a greater Joshua, Yeshua, or Jesus, will provide us with eternal rest in a land far better than the land they inherited long ago. This is what the writers meant by a better covenant with better promises. And this is why we have even better reasons to endure to the end in our own race to inherit these eternal blessings. This is a basic summary of the epistle to the Hebrews up to chapter 8. And we have sufficiently set the stage for the next chapters, which will be comparing the earthly tabernacle of the first covenant to the new and living way in the new covenant. So without further delay, Let's pick up in Hebrews chapter 9. The writers, after spending almost three chapters on the superior priesthood of Jesus, begin to describe the portable temple God instructed Moses to build by saying, Even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary, for a tabernacle was prepared. The first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. Clearly, the book of Hebrews began to describe the tabernacle pattern here with some limited details to prepare the reader for all that would be discussed afterwards. And we would do well to familiarize ourselves with this pattern before moving forward, especially since the pattern of the tabernacle will be used in the next chapter to describe exactly how you and I can enter the Holy of Holies through the new and living way. Well, after God verbally gave Moses the commandments at Mount Sinai, 
Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And during that time, the instructions for the tabernacle and the Levitical priesthood were given to Moses in great detail, along with the tablets of the Ten Commandments written by the very finger of God. The Lord said to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. And it was at the sanctuary that Moses met with God to receive instructions on how to lead the people of Israel. God gave Moses the instructions for the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat that sat above the Ark. And then he said, You shall put the mercy seat on top of the Ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you. And there I will meet with you. And I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony. About everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So the golden ark and its pure golden lid, the mercy seat, were like a portable throne for God's glory to rest upon above the Ten Commandments. Then God described how they were to make the golden table of the bread of the presence, the solid gold lampstand, the golden altar of incense, the golden walls, woven curtains, screens, doors, and veil, the bronze laver, the bronze altar, and the outer wall of the sanctuary. Now if you were to approach the sanctuary that was situated in the center of the camp of Israel, the first item you would see was the outer wall. It was made out of white linen, and it was seven and a half feet tall, and it had only one opening that faced the east. The north wall was 150 feet long. The south wall was 150 feet long. The west wall was 75 feet long, and the east side featured a 30 foot long gate between two sections of wall that were each 22 and a half feet long. If you were then to enter through the gate, the first item you would see would be the bronze altar where all of the blood sacrifices were offered by fire to the Lord. The ground would be soaked with the blood of the sacrifices that the priests were to pour out on the ground after sanctifying the altar with it. And this blood would serve as a constant reminder of the brutal consequences of sin. Beyond the bronze altar, but still in the outer court, there was a bronze laver or wash bowl. And about this basin, the Lord said, When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water, lest they die. And just as the outer walls of the court formed a rectangle, the golden walls of the sanctuary were arranged into a rectangle as well. The walls were made up of planks overlaid with gold, and each plank was 27 inches wide and 15 feet tall. So when God said that there should be 20 planks on the north and south, that meant that the walls on these sides were 45 feet long. And when he said that there were six planks on the west side, that means that the west side was 13 and a half feet wide. So with the outer court, the gate, the bronze altar, the laver, and the walls of the tabernacle laid out, we can now imagine the blue, purple, and scarlet woven screen or door to the tabernacle that was 15 feet tall and 13 and a half feet wide. If you were to pass through that screen, after washing in the laver, you would then be in the room sometimes known as the holy place. On your right side, you would see the table of the bread of the presence with 12 loaves of freshly baked bread that were changed out every Sabbath. And this bread was for the priests to eat in the presence of the Lord. And opposite of the table of showbread, which stood in the presence of the Lord, the golden lampstand illuminated the holy place with seven lamps that rested on seven ornate stems. The center stem and the three branches that extended out from either side 
were adorned with ornamental knobs and flowers, all hammered out of one approximately 75-pound talent of pure gold. And straight ahead, after you entered the door of the tabernacle, there would have been a gold altar for burning incense before the Lord, and special holy incense was to be burned on that altar in the morning and the evening before the presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies. And just beyond that altar, separating the holy place from the Holy of Holies or the most holy place, there was a blue, purple, and scarlet woven veil with cherubim depictions on it, illustrating the hosts of angels that surround the throne of God in heaven. And the linen ceiling of the tabernacle was made in the same way as the veil. So before even entering the veil, the priest would have seen angels above and angels in front of him. And the image of the angels would have been reflected on the golden walls as the whole scene was flooded with light from the golden lampstand and fragrance from the golden altar of incense and the scent of fresh baked bread. But behind the veil, in the area known as the holiest of all, the brilliant manifestation of the glory of God rested over the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant, and only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, after making extensive preparations, could the high priest alone enter briefly into the Holy of Holies beyond the veil with great fear and trembling. Within the holiest chamber of all, the Ark of the Covenant contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments, a golden jar of manna and Aaron's rod that budded, to remind the people of God of his covenant, of his faithful provision for their needs, and his sovereign selection of the priesthood. And on top of the ark was the mercy seat, or more literally, the place of atonement, where God would meet with Moses from between the cherubim to instruct him regarding his people. The Greek word that means atonement is what Hebrews calls the mercy seat, and if you pronounce that word at one minute, you will begin to understand the true purpose of the tabernacle. You see, our inconceivably holy and loving God desires to fellowship with us and be at one with us. But because of sin, a system of purification and sanctification had to be established so we could approach his holy throne because our God is a consuming fire. And until Jesus laid down his life on the cross of Calvary, the veil was shut, and no one could truly enter the Holy of Holies to fellowship with God as he desired. True oneness with God was not possible through the blood of bulls and goats, but through the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we can boldly approach the throne of grace in ways that only Moses ever experienced before. It was this principle that the veil was closed until Jesus opened the way by his death on the cross that chapter 9 and 10 will be relying on as the writers compare the two covenants. But an understanding of the pattern of the tabernacle and the restrictions imposed under the Levitical system is necessary to fully appreciate all that the letter to the Hebrews is communicating. So in closing, now that we have explored the pattern, we will wrap up our time together by putting all of these pieces together to understand the original way one would approach the Lord in the Levitical Covenant.
Friends, as impressive as that earthly tabernacle was, with the cloud of the Lord over it by day, and the fire over it by night, we will soon learn that it merely represents the shadow of how we approach the real throne of God on Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem through the new and living way opened for us by our victorious Messiah. 